Uh, I'd like to thank an awful lot of people who made tonight possible. Uh, the Chautauqua Healthcare Network, Stan Lundin, thank you very much, Stan, for, for supporting this today. This is a, a real vote of uh, thank you very much. Stan? Yes. All right, Stan. There he is up there. Thank you, Stan. M&T Bank, uh, Doreen Sixby, Kevin Brombacker, thanks so much for all of your support. WCA Hospital, got the chairman of the board here, Greg Edwards. Thanks so much, Greg. And for those who are able, uh, after this performance, there'll be a reception downstairs sponsored by WCA Hospital. Thanks so much, Greg. Also, I want to thank Dr. John Lamacuso and Dr. Peter Walter. Uh, Peter, being a fellow urologist, uh, was uh, very important for making this event happen. We would neither be here today nor certainly accomplish what we have without the beneficence of Betty Lene and Carl Kapp. And I'd just like to pause and, and thank Betty, who's here tonight. Thank you very much, Betty, for everything you've done for us. Also, Carl Kappa was in lockstep with Betty throughout that process. And Jeanette, on behalf of the family, please accept and receive our thanks. guidance and our leadership to get us into the direction where we're going, where we are today, uh, could not have happened without uh, the leadership of Dan Braddon and Juanita. Thanks for coming and continuing that Braddon tradition. Appreciate everything. <laughs> we had wonderful and early support from the foundations. We want to thank all of them, the Gabby, Holquist, Sheldon, Dara, Shuck Region Community Foundation, and I'm sure I'm missing a few. Uh, I just want to say thank you very much. The Robert Jackson Center has also been blessed with the guidance of our current executive director, and he's a real class act, Raleigh Kidder. Raleigh, wherever you are, he's really taking us to another level. Probably not only gives, he's our idea guy, but he's also the guy probably checking the Johns to make sure there's enough toilet paper. <laughs> We're also led by a, a wonderful board consisting of Randy Sweeney, Harold Adams, Jeanette Carlson, Judge Cass, Bruce Janowski, and of course, Betty Lenay. Our heartfelt thanks to all of them. This has been a little more than a year and a half uh, adventure. We've accomplished an awful lot, and we thank all of them, and we thank all of you. And tonight is one of those extraordinary events, which will, uh, and I know you'll exceedingly enjoy it. It's a treat. Um, in the Spring 2000 magazine from the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Columbia University concisely described our guest tonight as a urologist, historical collector, sleuth, a medical man for all seasons. He's written several books, and I, I think if you've read the articles that have appeared in the Post Journal or listened to the press releases that have appeared in the uh, WJTN and WKSN uh, and the media that's provided us in Time Warner, you'll note all of, you know, Dr. Latimer's credentials. Just a few, a few that have appeared in the dust jacket of a book, which uh, is wonderful read. It's called Hitler's Fatal Sickness and Other Secrets of the Nazi Leaders, Behind the Scenes at the Nuremberg Trial, authored by Dr. John K. Latimer. Dr. John K. Latimer is Professor and Chairman Emeritus of the Department of Urology at the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Columbia University, a one-time trustee of the Presbyterian Hospital, and a renowned surgeon. Dr. Latimer was President of the American Urological Association, President of the International Society of Urology, Governor of the American College of Surgeons, a member of the National Research Council, and had a presidential appointment to the World Health Organization, and is a member of the Arms and Armor Committee of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. That's the medical side. The sleuthing side is there are chapters dedicated to a guy who is an extraordinary collector. Uh, I tend to dabble in that field myself, so I can appreciate all that Dr. Latimer has accumulated over time. Much of his collection is currently loaned out to presidential libraries throughout the United States, the Metrop Metropolitan Museum of Art. And we haven't talked about this, but we hope sometime we'll have some of this here loaned to the Robert H. Jackson Center. Uh, you don't have to respond to that because I'm putting you right on the spot. <laughs> uh, but he's been a, a tremendous collector, especially in the area of uh, President Lincoln's assassination. He's done an awful lot of studies on that. Uh, President 
Kennedy's assassination, and has been also interested in the book which he <coughs> authored here on the Nuremberg Trials. He has been the author of 375 scientific articles, as well as books and articles, as I mentioned, on Lincoln and Kennedy assassinations, including a book entitled Kennedy and Lincoln, Medical and Ballistic Comparisons of Their Assassinations. To put this into perspective, our guest tonight, an American physician who attended, observed, and spoke on a personal basis with the 22 top Nazi leaders on trial at Nuremberg. For the first time in this book, he shared revelations gleaned from conversations about life and death at the highest levels of the Third Reich, not to mention the relationship of each defendant had with Adolf Hitler. As the book indicates, there, with, he's provided us the story with hundreds of photographs, and you'll see some of those today in this slide presentation. Uh, i got to tell you just quickly how I even came across Dr. Latimer. As you remember, the prosecutors were here last October. Uh, virtually all of the prosecutors who were with Justice Jackson at Nuremberg were here. The only one who could not make it was Drexel Sprecher. We went down to Washington to interview Drexel Sprecher in order to complete the group. Uh, through the course of that conversation, Drexel Sprecher had organized a reunion of Nuremberg, Nuremberg-ers, I believe, they refer to themselves. And throughout that process, he handed me a video which highlighted that particular event. Within the video was an extraordinary presentation by our guest tonight, Dr. John Latimer, uh, who was out, did pause for a deep breath in order to try to make sure we could track down Dr. Latimer. We've done so and are pleased to present him tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. John Latimer. Well, thank you very much, Greg. Uh, let me say that. My family, uh, in years gone by, uh, came right through here in our looking for paradise uh, out in further west. And uh, having started from Connecticut, they ended up in, first in uh, uh, New York State. Uh, starting out from Hartford, they went to New Hartford, which is now Utica, New York. And uh, then uh, the Erie Canal, as they called it, was built. And so they came out here, and they settled immediately north of Buffalo. And uh, the thing that bothered them was the snow. <laughs> and then those years were so deep that it was a problem. And then they heard about the promised land at the other end of the lake, so they took the boat to uh, Detroit. And from Detroit, uh, Michigan had been condemned by the surveyors as a swamp. It wasn't worth anything. And uh, uh, one of their members had gone out into the swamp and discovered that it was really very habitable. And uh, if you avoided the Indians and uh, could make your way through the forest, it turned out to be quite uh, handsome. And uh, you could, this was called the Dexter Trail, after Mr. Dexter that broke the trail. And uh, uh, then the railroads came and began to work their way across Michigan, and some of the family came that way. And uh, uh, as it turned out, I was born in Michigan in a house very much like this house. When I looked up and saw the row of columns across the front, it uh, looked very familiar. So I'm delighted to be back here uh, at uh, Greg's invitation and uh, to tell you uh, some more highlights about uh, the trials that were conducted by Mr. Jackson. And uh, let me start by telling I was involved mostly with the Normandy invasion uh, type of uh, activity against the enemy. And uh, when the Japanese bombed us uh, in Pearl Harbor, uh, everybody volunteered. And the medical profession volunteered, all of the young doctors joined up, and the Army Medical Service did a wonderful job. They organized 1,000-bed hospitals, a great many of them, uh, to support the Normandy invasion. And uh, they were scattered all over England. And uh, uh, if we can have the first slide now, the troop ships, and this uh, cabin was supposed to contain two bunks. And as you see, there were double rows of bunks all the way to the ceiling. And you had to be careful when you turned over because your hip would hit the bottom of the bunk above you, which was made of wire mesh. And uh, your hip got cut up. Uh, if we'd been torpedoed, we never would have had a chance of getting out. But in any case, uh, most of us made it in good shape. And uh, once we were in England, the next slide, uh, we began to train uh, for the invasion. 
And uh, these were the army nurses in my hospital unit. Uh, and when we went through New York, uh, this was at Christmas time on the way to England, and uh, we got a, a final leave. We all went to Radio City Music Hall, and the Rockettes have a Holloway uh, program that they put on that uh, includes a, uh, uh, a toy soldier's drill routine. Well, we all took little pads of paper and copied down what it was they did, and we could do it better than they could. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we made the front page of the New York Times with this one. And uh, uh, then uh, we moved on to the beach, and uh, this was a, a, a terrible day because there was absolutely no cover. The Germans were way up there on the, on the bluff above us and firing down on us, and there was no protection whatsoever. And, uh, uh, well, they slaughtered us. The way it looked to me is that uh, they kept on mowing us down uh, until they ran out of ammunition. And uh, there was no, they were up along here, and they had what they called interlocking raising curtains of fire which meant that they, when they fired their artillery, every inch of that beach was covered. And then they moved it up one and fired another round, and it covered the next 50 feet and then more, so that there was no cover at all. And these are all dead kids. Uh, there were a few tanks that had been equipped with a flotation collar. Uh, and well, incidentally, if you can't hear me up in the upper ranks, please just say so, and I'll talk louder. But uh, in any case, um, since there was no cover, everybody tried to get behind them. The trouble was that the uh, artillery shells would go under the tank and cut the feet off all these men. And I had at one point uh, three cots, the three adjacent cots, uh, with three men. They were all or left of a 300-man company of combat engineers that had been put off to clean up these obstacles. And uh, they were congratulating each other that they were still alive and none of them had any feet. They had all been cut off by this artillery fire. It was a terrible day and we lost an a, a, a enormous number of men, but we made it. And the next slide. Get all the buttons arranged here. Uh, among these obstacles that the Germans uh, laid down uh, were things like this to stop vehicles and tanks and, and boats for that matter. Well, very often there would be a, a mine on top of these things with a tremendous amount of explosive, and these were hard to take, but uh, it was possible to get around them, and we finally did. Well, these are dead kids uh, piled up on the beach like cordwood, the French civilians looking at them. And, uh, uh, and then as we worked our way inland, this is what the Germans had done to the uh, French and later Belgian fortifications. They just smashed them all to pieces. And uh, uh, well, Patton came along and he said, you know, to you other generals, I am going to pee in the Rhine River before any of you. And here he is doing it. And as you can notice from the size of his stream, he had a good urologist. <laughs> well, we finally finally uh, liberated Paris, and the French, uh, the French make the best medals, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and they gave us all medals for the 50th anniversary of it here a little while ago. <clears throat> and uh, then I was, I say, one of the few doctors that had had any experience as a commander of troops. So anytime there was anything military demanded of the hospital staff, I got tagged with it. And I was the train commander every time we moved as a hospital train. And uh, uh, it, it, it worked out. Uh, well, then we began to overrun German trains that were full of bodies. Now, these bodies were en route to the concentration camps, and if they got stalled, uh, the people just died. It was the coldest winter they'd had in years. And the only facilities in this uh, train were pots like this in, in each car, and the litter, the, the floor was littered with fecal material and dead people. It was terrible. And, uh, uh, then we, we discovered that these, these camps, these labor camps, were being used uh, by the labor uh, commissar or, or head uh, as a source of manpower to work in the local factories. And they, these hundreds and hundreds of men went out every day. And uh, then they'd come back to these uh, ramshackle huts and uh, uh, with very thin clothing on. These uh, striped pajamas that they wore were very thin and very inadequate for the cold of the winter, and uh, uh, very often they would come back and the, the supervisor, the SS supervisor, would say, well, now I see a list of 60 men, and the uh, uh, 
master of the house would say yes. And he says, well, tomorrow I want to see 40 men. Well, that night, 20 men were allowed to stand out in the cold and die. And uh, it was uh, very impressive because the dead from each day were laid out uh, by their huts. And uh, there were an awful lot of them. And if they didn't die off, they were pushed into the shower bath room, uh, which was the, the doors of which could be dogged down and shut. And then live steam was run in there, or cyanide gas, and killed them all. And the Browse Bad is the shower bath uh, name, which is somebody's already crossed off. Uh, well, in the room just before the shower bath were lots of bodies being, uh, that uh, are just after the shower bath uh, to be burned, and the furnaces, as you'll see in a moment. But the thing that impressed me about this room was the wall over there with uh, a stucco wall. Uh, imprinted with bloody finger fingerprints uh, from the fingers uh, worn to the to the bloody stumps by some of these that weren't dead, but uh, dead or not, uh, what was happening was that they were stacked on these channels and pushed into the furnaces and burned by gas flames, and this went on day and night, and the odor around these these camps was unbearable, and yet the natives in the vicinity never admit any knowing about anything that bad that went on there. And, uh, uh, well, here's another pile of bodies. And uh, uh, the British got so they handled them by bulldozing a big pit and then bulldozing the bodies into the pit. And it was a sickening thing to see them tumble over and over. Uh, but this was, was going on. Well, then the Germans, the idiots that they were, when they got into uh, areas like in Russia, where uh, the natives welcomed them as liberators against their, uh, from the communist yoke, uh, any infraction that they could uh, uh, invoke against the natives, uh, they would punish by hanging them. They'd line them up on a bench and push them off the bench and hang them. And this was ridiculous because these people would have been collaborators with the Germans if the Germans had been uh, sensible about it, which they were not under Hitler's uh, guidance. And well, we finally made it all the way across uh, Germany uh, to Hitler's house uh, in Berchtesgaden. And uh, this was a beautiful, great big house. And uh, uh, it was loaded with supplies and food and for a, for a long war. And uh, there were tunnels underneath it, incidentally, that went to all the adjacent houses. And they were loaded with food and, and uh, uh, survival equipment. Well, when it was obvious that we were closing in on them, uh, the commander of this, uh, the garrison of this uh, Berghof unit uh, permitted the local citizens of, uh, of Berchtesgaden to loot the house. And they, as a consequence, the town of Berchtesgaden was loaded with relics from, uh, that belonged to Hitler and Eva. And uh, uh, if you want to spend some time at it, you might acquire a few, which some of us did. Uh, this was the garage. And up on the top of that, uh, it was a terrace. It was Hitler's favorite meeting place. Well, after they had looted the house, they set fire to it. So when we got there, it was a smoldering uh, half ruin. Also, uh, the smoke screen, which uh, uh, was normally used to protect it. Here, if they started, as soon as the enemy bomber, bombers were heard, uh, they'd start filling the, the area with smoke. And within a very few minutes, they'd make it impenetrable and protected the house very well all through the war. But at the end, when the, the uh, early warning network broke down uh, and they didn't do this, the, the British got over there with some of their heavy bombers and uh, hit the house real hard and knocked part of it away, as we say, see in a moment. Well, in any case, I was called back from, the, from Berchtesgaden to Munich. And uh, we took over this German civilian hospital, which is on the outer skirts of, uh, uh, northern outskirts of uh, Munich. Uh, called Schwabing, and uh, these were all big buildings. Uh, this one I filled up with my cases. And then in this area, in this building, were the operating rooms. And uh, if somebody needed an operation, there was a concrete so sidewalk that ran from each building to the operating room. And there was no protection over it. And the Germans would roll their gurneys with a patient on it through the rain and snow <laughs> into the operating room and operate on them and then roll them back under no protection. Uh, it was ridiculous, but uh, that's the way it was. And uh, uh, there, was, uh, there was no declaration of intent to protect the civilians by Hitler. And well, the first thing we did was start building 
uh, coverage over the over the walkways. But in any case, the the chaplain of our 98th General Hospital, U.S. Army General Hospital now, as we called it, uh, was called upon to come up to where they were gathering all of the important Nazi prisoners together to decide who to try in the first showcase trial. And uh, um, this was a place up in Mondorf in Luxembourg. And uh, uh, he was asked to come up and represent the Protestant religion among these prisoners. And uh, uh, he did that. And they liked him very much and appreciated his coming. And then it, he had enough points to go home. So the prisoners wrote to his wife back in the States with his permission and asked uh, if he couldn't stay on with them. And uh, she agreed, so he did. He stayed on right to the end of the trial, which took about a year, and uh, walked a lot of them to the gallows. But uh, uh, in any case, he came back one day and he said to me, you know, you've got to see this. And uh, so I, next time he went back, uh, I rode up with him. and. Uh, he introduced me to all of the prisoners, and they loved him, his attention and uh, his hard work on their behalf. So anything you wanted, they were agreeable to talk about or tell you. And it was great to have uh, that entree to people like Goering and, uh, and uh, all of the rest of them. Uh, and so I was happy to do that and very impressed with what uh, I was able to learn from the prisoners uh, on that basis, plus some other advantages that I'll tell you about in a moment. Well, the next slide. Uh, here in this group of people that was uh, uh, getting the trial together was Mr. Jackson. Now, Mr. Jackson was a extraordinary person without whom the trials would not have been possible uh, for more reasons than you might think. Uh, in the Army, there is a very decided uh, level of responsibility about who can do what. And for example, if Patton, in charge of the Third Army, had wanted to do something about a trial, uh, he would have had hard work uh, persuading Bradley, who was the commander of the First Army, or the fellow in charge of the Seventh Army, to do it his way. Jackson didn't have that problem. He had been appointed by Roosevelt, the President of the United States, as our chief prosecutor, and anything he wanted, he got. Well, what he wanted, what he insisted upon, which had not been conceived, uh, I think, in the beginning, was that everything that went on in that court had to be recorded and it had to be reproduced in, in four languages. And uh, it had to be done right away. And this is, this is the kind of work that you can't get done in the Army unless you have infinite power. And uh, Mr. Jackson had that. And he didn't hesitate to use it, I can tell you. And uh, uh, it, uh, uh, well, it, it didn't irritate anybody much because they, we just got hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, GIs in there to do the, the kind of uh, uh, work that he demanded of them. And as a consequence, uh, we had a, a real trial. And uh, every day, the amount of paperwork, the thin sheets of paper stacked one on top of the other would be taller than a man. And uh, it was it was fantastic to see it uh, accumulate and to realize what a difficult thing it was to manage or a difficult thing to order done and get it to be done, and he did it. Now, I realized that uh, he had been presented with the idea of taking this job, uh, realizing there was some risk to it because uh, he was uh, more or less promised by Roosevelt that if he would do that, uh, he might become the next uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and uh, I'm, I'm sure he would have. But, as you know, Roosevelt died inopportunely before the, well, before the trial even started, and, uh, or before it came to a conclusion in any case. And uh, so he lost his leverage at home, and at the trial, he ran into unexpected problems. Uh, you know, the, the German language, for example, is tricky. And it is very vulnerable to uh, double entendre and peculiar meanings for words. And Goering, the, the lead uh, uh, suspect of the, among the Nazis, uh, was very skillful at that kind of thing and would make the simple thing very difficult by uh, simple means. Well, I can give you an example. Uh, there was a lot of talk about Goering uh, being uh, uh, unable to have a child. 
he'd married a, a Swedish countess who had had children before, uh, who, admir who idolized Goering, incidentally, but um, uh, he didn't have any children with her, and she got sick and died of tuberculosis so that there was no further uh, occasion to. Well, then uh, he had been shot during the Hitler's attempt to take over the Bavarian parliament by force. Now, the police, he didn't, Hitler didn't think they would shoot at a war hero like Goering, and they had von Ludendorff, another war hero, but they did, and they wounded Goering, and they had to smuggle him out of Germany for him to heal. And during that time, he had this painful wound in the groin, and uh, he got addicted to morphine. And so with morphine, he was not going to have any children, and he did not. Uh, well, they, after his wife died, they got him off the morphine. She had persuaded him to go into an insane asylum and be locked up to get off the drug, and he did. And he got off it. And then when she died, he married a very attractive uh, German movie actress, Emmy, and uh, uh, almost immediately uh, she became pregnant. Well, there was a comedian in Germany, and there was a, among our prisoners, there was a newspaper editor named Stryker, who was always looking for something mean to say. And they started saying, well, now, if this pregnancy turns out to be a boy, uh, he, ought to be, he ought to be named Romeo, uh, uh, from Romeo and Juliet. Uh, and he ought to remember the lines, uh, you know, uh, is he or is he not? And uh, uh, what uh, they were, in German, what that meant was, was he or was he not really Hermann Goering's child? Well, this kind of double entendre was very common in German, and, uh, and uh, Goering was a master of it. And he gave uh, Jack, Mr. Jackson a hard time uh, repeatedly with that kind of tactic, uh, which was, was too bad. But uh, in any case, it was a difficult thing for Mr. Jackson to do. Mr. Jackson was wonderful in his opening statements and in his summations. Uh, but in the, in the nitty gritty of the trial, it was, uh, it was hard for him, and no doubt about it. And being away when the Chief Justice did die, when I, the opportunity to just succeed him did arise, he wasn't there. He was over in Germany with the trial. And uh, uh, Truman, who succeeded uh, Roosevelt, was not uh, as friendly a guy as you might expect. And uh, as a consequence, Mr. Jackson lost out, which was too bad. And uh, he stayed with the trial until just the day before the hanging, or a couple of days before, and then came back uh, to resume his uh, duties with the Supreme Court. Uh, well, the next slide is uh, how he looked at to us in the courtroom. Uh, here he is down here in the lower right, and these are all part of uh, his uh, colleagues and some of the Russians up here and the Frenchmen. And uh, uh, most of the time he would listen, and occasionally he'd, he'd break in uh, with a penetrating question or insist on an answer. And uh, uh, otherwise, it was, uh, it was a very boring time. It was a whole year of that kind of thing where uh, Goering, for example, would listen to the question, and it would be a simple question. Then he'd wait for the four-language translation and uh, uh, wait all the way through it. And then when he heard, he heard all of the, of the uh, revisions, uh, he would answer, nine. <laughs> and uh, one of the British judges jumped on him at more than once. Uh, and said, you know, come on, Goering, you understand English perfectly well. Answer the question. And Goering, just ignore him and take all the time. So day after day after day, uh, this kind of thing went on. It was, it was tough uh, to suffer through, and Mr. Jackson suffered through it. But as I say, it was, it was, it was hard on him. And uh, uh, he was succeeded when he did go home by Telford Taylor, a young uh, lawyer from Columbia, and uh, uh, he carried on through the many, what, 10 or more other trials that they had after that, and uh, uh, did a good job of it. Uh, and uh, I, then I f found out that in addition coming from Columbia was the chief psychiatrist that they had assigned to the trial uh, to keep track of these uh, men. And uh, he had been in Columbia at the same time I had uh, as training. I didn't know him at that time, but we had a common bond in any case. and. Uh, uh, then about that time, we captured uh, uh, Stryker, who was a, uh, in, in, in his true life, he uh, was shaved off like a cue ball. And his, his uh, hair, hairs that you saw were black and dirty. 
Well, as a disguise, he let his beard grow and came in white, and you didn't recognize him at all. It didn't look anything like the pictures that we had of the people we were looking for that were uh, the, the top Nazis. And uh, uh, the, the natives hated him and turned him in and uh, uh, insisted that was him. So we brought him in, and sure enough, it was. And uh, uh, he was a, a newspaper editor, and he, had, he ran this uh, uh, newspaper, anti-Jewish newspaper, that had these gross, gross uh, cartoons of wicked uh, Jewish uh, leaders. And uh, he also had a Bible. And in the Bible, he had marked off passageways, passages, uh, to indicate that the Bible was basically anti-Semitic. And uh, he had that Bible with him. And uh, he also was studying English. And uh, uh, after he was condemned to be hanged in two weeks, uh, one of the other people said to him, well, Stryker, why in the world are you bothering to speak and continue to study English when you're going to be gone in another 10 days? And he said, oh, didn't you know in heaven they speak English? And the man thought about that a minute. He said, well, yeah, but Stryker, suppose you go the other way. Oh, well, he said, that's all right. I already speak French. <laughs> He was a clever little guy. Well, among our, another psychiatrist that was with us uh, uh, was uh, Eli Goldenson, and from New York, too, so we had a common bond. And he was a, a very obvious uh, uh, Jewish fellow, and he and another psychiatrist were asked to decide whether Stryker could come to court one day, and they decided he could. Uh, he had a little heart murmur. And... Then they worried that maybe they'd made a bad decision, and when they strike or went, he'd die, and then they'd be blamed. So they paid a great deal of attention to examining him. That impressed Stryker favorably. So he wrote, uh, uh, what this man did was to go to the, the bookstore, the, the libraries in, in uh, uh, Munich, and pick out, or uh, in Nuremberg, and pick out books written by each one of these Nazi writers, uh, uh, officials. And uh, then he would have them sign them and dedicate them to him. And uh, when Stryker heard that, uh, he had him get a book of his. And in it, he made this extravagant, uh, affectionate uh, uh, greeting to <laughs> Dr. Goldenson, which was very embarrassing from him, <laughs> because here was this leading anti-Semite uh, with this uh, affectionate greeting. Well, uh, we also kept a, a uh, German doctor which is the one that passed out the pills every night and uh, answered their questions, and a German dentist, and uh, they helped us very much. And uh, we also captured this man who'd lie, who'd been in charge of the uh, labor <coughs> movement, and he would go to labor meetings in Nazi Germany and make these extravagant claims about what Hitler was going to do for everybody and get sheared uh, endlessly and Hitler was delighted with this. Well, when the text of his address came out, it didn't have any of this good stuff in it. But uh, uh, Hitler loved him because he was keeping everybody happy. And uh, uh, again, he was trying to pass himself off as an itinerant artist. And uh, uh, the local natives turned him in. And uh, these are men from the 501 Parachute Infantry, one of my old outfits, who uh, found him because the natives pointed him out and insisted that was him. And indeed, it was. So, as I say, we began to turn him up. Well, that man was so pathological in his statements that you knew he had a brain injury of a certain type with the frontal lobes. And when he, he, he committed suicide in his cell by taking a strip of cloth and putting it around his, his neck and leaning forward until it choked off the arteries to his head. And uh, at his autopsy here, his brain did indeed show exactly the kind of lesion that you could predict uh, from his behavior. And... Uh, well, then Goering was our prize uh, uh, patient, prize prisoner, and he wrote continuously to everybody in sight, his wife and his child and uh, all his friends, and uh, that fountain pen that he has there is in our collection. Uh, he would also chew the end off. He liked American fountain pens, but he'd chew the end off all of them. <laughs> and when we got him, uh, well, here's his fountain pen with the end chewed off. And uh, uh, here's his coat, because... Hitler turned on him, and he began to eat. And he got up to 312 pounds, and his, thigh, his, his thighs got so fat that they rubbed together and rubbed all the skin off. That's called intertrigo. And uh, uh, he was had these painful lesions on his legs. 
So in his baggage, he brought with him two or three jars full of skin cream. It was opaque, and uh, in the skin cream, unbeknownst to any of us, were two ampules of cyanide, uh, one on each one. And he had a third ampule of cyanide, which he kept in a can of coffee crystals, and uh, we found that right away. Well, everybody relaxed, you know, we found it. They all had one, and uh, we didn't know about the other ones uh, in, the, in the skin cream, but uh, uh, there they were. Well, this was this uh, tweed uh, uh, hunting coat, uh, which was for him when he weighed 300 pounds. In the back, there was a gusset that you could let out to make it even accommodate an even fatter tummy. But uh, uh, this is part of our uh, collection as well. And here he is wearing that jacket and uh, standing over a dead elk on his hunting preserve. Uh, he was the head huntsman of the Third Reich. And uh, one of our one of our prison, prison guards, a uh, kid from Texas, was also a hunter. And uh, Goering would, would get him in conversation and they'd talk about hunting uh, endlessly. And uh, another way of getting himself in good with the guards so that when he wanted to get out his skin cream, he could. And it worked out very well because uh, two hours before, well, here was his, his leader hose and his leather pants, who were 300 pounder wearing him. And uh, uh, oh, here's his ring that I'm wearing myself at this moment so you can see it. And uh, it has one of his uh, many titles. Uh, this, he was the Reichsminister President in this uh, particular one. It's, a, it's upside down and backwards because it's a seal uh, to seal documents. And it had the family crest on it with a, a mailed fist holding a ring and these animals uh, supporting it. And uh, goldsmith's marks on the back and so forth. Everything he had was beautifully made and uh, very expensive and the best possible workmanship. And uh, 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 here was Goering when he was running the German Air Force. And uh, if, if Hitler likes you, he gave you a picture of himself with a silver frame, a, a smaller one of these. And uh, Goering, in typical Goering fashion, I had to have a bigger one. So he had one twice as big as anybody else. And here it happens to be, and I, I own it as part of my collection. And here's when Lindbergh and his wife were visiting Goering at the request of our Air Force. Now he took a lot of flack from everybody because he went over there and not only did they let him uh, see the, these uh, uh, wonderful German new fighter planes that we'd heard about and never saw, and they let him fly them. And I said, how in the world did you dare fly a multi-million dollar prototype uh, with notoriously narrow landing gear, it was very difficult. And he said, well, if you remember, where I met him was at my family's home in Michigan, uh, Selfridge Field, which was the only place we had a fighter plane base. And uh, uh, I'd seen him strapping bombs on the bottom of his fighter plane to drop on the water and skip into the target and hit it, uh, skip bombing, which he invented. And we worked very well against the Japanese. and. Uh, uh, this was so successful at going to visit uh, Goering and the Germans that our Army Air Force sent him back time and time again. I think he made something like seven trips to Germany. And each time he came back with detailed information on one or more of their new airplanes and uh, often flew them. And each time he took with him a production man who could look at the factory and tell him how many they could produce a week or a month. and. Uh, he said, you know, this is bad news. You don't want to tackle them, they'll kill you. And uh, so our government was very slow to, to uh, do anything about it. And as you know, uh, Lindbergh took a terrible beating because people were saying, well, he was against the war, and so forth. He wasn't at all. I interrogated him about this at some length, and he was not at all uh, against the war, nor he was anti-Semitic. It was a matter of timing. And he based it on knowledge. And the knowledge was, was very well spelled out and, and, and written up uh, for the benefit of our people. Well, uh, uh, in any case, uh, uh, they wanted him to go to Germany and live, and he didn't want, well, the war broke out, so he could Well, as I say, uh, uh, Goering was then up to 300 and some pounds, and he married this movie actress, uh, and immediately she got pregnant and had the pregnancy, had brought forth a very nice little girl. and who uh, incidentally rebuffed Hitler's advances going kitschy kitschy coo and she was having none of it. And uh, uh, well, here they were at the wedding with him weighing 300 uh, pounds. And uh, uh, here he is after we put him on the army diet during the trial. <laughs> we took 100 pounds off him. 
and uh, it made a, it made him infinitely healthier, and uh, he accepted that. In fact, that's the way we got him to do it, was to flatter him that he could do it, and it would be good for his figure and everything else, and uh, he did. Notice, incidentally, that the guards are all bigger than the defendant. They never permitted a, again, this is a part of Mr. Jackson's ideas, that you never had guards that were smaller than the, than the prisoner. <laughs> and uh, it was hard to find people that, that from the right outfits and the right everything, and, but they did. And here he is talking to some of the other defendants. Uh, well, he brought with him a suitcase, this suitcase, and it was full of the world's supply of a, at that time, brand new uh, uh, analgesic uh, called paracodine. We call it Vicodin now. Very effective, very good, very non-toxic, and uh, in all ways very satisfactory. And uh, uh, it was made in Germany only, so it was probably all there was. And it was, this suitcase was packed with it. And he would pour out 100 pills in the morning and eat them like peanuts all day. And uh, uh, made him feel cheerful. And we had to <laughs> persuade him that he was smarter than those other people so he could, he could break the habit. Uh, and we started reducing him one pill a day. And I got a couple of indignant letters from him saying, you've got to cut this out and give me back my, my ration. But uh, we did. We got him off it by the end of the trial. And by the, in fact, when the trial started, after the first two or three months, we got him off it. And uh, throughout the trial, he was not on it uh, at all. But this is the case in which uh, the pills were. And another thing he had with him uh, when he was brought in was this chronometer. And you know, in the old days, before we had radio uh, uh, to control our airplane flights, the way you planned your flight from here to New York, let's say, was that you went uh, uh, at so many, at, at say 100 miles an hour, you went so many seconds on this leg of the map, and then you turned so many degrees, and you went so many more seconds on the next leg, and then so many more seconds on the next leg, and that's the way you got to your destination. So this chronometer thing with all of these stopwatch features was uh, very important, and it was important that it be a good one. And this had his name, had his name on the back, and it was one of the best makes. And this was in the baggage room, uh, earmarked as a possession of Goering. And uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, next slide shows this uh, prison guard wearing it. And at the same time, uh, it was still listed in the, in, the, uh, in the inventory as the stopwatch, a wristwatch, uh, of Hermann Goering. Uh, so uh, in any case, it was uh, used not exactly as a bribe, but it, uh, it made it easier that we, when he wanted something that the guards were more likely to uh, let him do it if they had been buttered up with uh, uh, gifts like this. And uh, he used it. Now, he did get into the baggage room repeatedly. Oh, here, incidentally, are the suitcases we were just looking at uh, that had the pills in, one of which had the pills in it. And here is a note from him uh, complaining that he wanted his blue notebook. Uh, and uh, uh, sure enough, the uh, next day he had it. So you knew that he got into the baggage room in spite of all the denials of all of the people in charge. Uh, well, when he decided that the jig was up, that they were going to hang him, he, they all expected that he might be, be put away the way we put the Kaiser away, remember, in World War I, and banished him and not hang him. Well, when it looked at the last minute that he, they were going to hang him, uh, he asked for his uh, skin cream. And in the skin cream, in this uh, uh, cut-off rifle, two cut-off rifle cartridge cases fitted together uh, to protect this little one cc glass ampule of cyanide, uh, he asked for it. And he got it, no problem, and uh, uh, dug this one out and dumped out the little glass ampule in his hand and, and uh, bit it, and he was dead, poof, like that. And uh, uh, incidentally, we, we, I forgot to bring it with me, but this is part of our collection as well. And uh, well, here he was, dead, and uh, no doubt about it. And this was two hours before the <laughs> hanging time started. Well, you'd be surprised how much uh, uh, flack we got that it really wasn't him. And then there were other people who wanted to hang him anyway, even if he was dead. <laughs> and so forth. But, uh, well, among the other, the other prisoners, notice this is Hess. And Hess had been uh, Hitler's secretary. He had written Hitler, Hitler's memoirs when he was put in prison after the first uh, incident when they tried to take over the, the parliament and were, were shot. And uh, 
Hitler was imprisoned, and then Hess volunteered to be imprisoned with him and acted as the secretary to, to transcribe the manuscript for Mein Kampf and so forth. And uh, now notice that Hitler is doing something funny with his left hand. What he's doing is holding on to the belt buckle of his Sam Brown belt. And what he's, why he's doing that is because he had a tremor that he had developed uh, first way back after the, uh, after the shooting, uh, uh, when, they were, when he was in prison, when Goering was wounded. And uh, that tremor was bothering him, and it would happen in his left hand, left hand. But if he grabbed something and, and gripped it tightly, as he's doing here uh, uh, on the belt, uh, the tremor stopped. So, of course, Hess, not knowing why he was doing it, he did the same because the boss did it. <laughs> but that's what Hess was like. He was a very placid, uh, malleable character, very smart and very capable as a, as a transcriber, uh, and was also quite daring because he, when the, it began to be obvious that the war wasn't going well, he thought, well, he'll solve the problem. He'll make a, a peace bid on Hitler's behalf. And uh, if you remember, he flew all by himself to uh, Scotland and, and parachuted out of the airplane, even though he'd never parachuted before. And he landed exactly in the right place near the uh, state of, uh, of this uh, Scotsman and uh, acted as a, tried to act as a go-between between Hitler and, uh, and uh, the British, uh, well, in this, by, by then, the British king had been more or less his functions had been taken over by old Churchill. And uh, one of his conditions was that, uh, that they dump Churchill and that they uh, uh, take over the government and, uh, and then that Hitler would be glad to com accommodate them with a, a, a peace. And uh, uh, as I say, he, with great skill, he made, he first of all, avoided the fighter plane patrols of his own people and the British and landed exactly where he wanted to be, and they took him to this uh, uh, Scottish uh, uh, nobleman who pushed him on to uh, uh, Churchill's people who said, just clap him in jail. And they did. They put him in as a common prisoner. Well, they also had a couple of strong-armed uh, people, uh, Tin Eye Smith and other people whose names uh, indicated that they were tough customers who were worked on prisoners, and... Uh, he was exposed to a fair amount of, uh, of trauma uh, one way or another for four years and uh, nobody knew exactly what, what went on except when we got him, when the war ended, and we brought him to be tried, he was obviously psychotic. He was obviously not with it. And uh, he gradually recovered some function, but he was never right uh, even then. And uh, uh, here he was in court. Uh, they, they sat the people in their order of their importance. Goering was first way over on this corner of the, of the prisoner's box. And then because he was designated number one to succeed Hitler by Hitler, and uh, Hess had been designated number two, uh, Goering was quite upset about, about this because Hess was a nobody. And uh, he appealed to Hitler about it. And Hitler said, look, don't worry about it. I've got to reward the people that were good to me. Uh, in the early days, and Hess had done him a lot of favors, including transcribing Mein Kampf. And uh, he said, it's no problem. He says, this, if, uh, if I die uh, uh, and you take over, all you can do is dump Hess. Well, Goering thought that was, a, that was a stroke of brilliance. So he would quote that as to how smart Hitler was and the kind of way he arranged things. Well, in court, uh, Hess began to exhibit, uh, well, stomach pains. And he would complain bitterly, and here you see him gritting his teeth and banging his fist on his knee, and uh, he would do this periodically, and uh, if it got real, ex real tense, he would uh, leave the courtroom. He'd get up and leave, and uh, he got away with it uh, surprisingly well because he was clearly uh, in a different world. And, uh, well, as you remember, uh, uh, they gave him life imprisonment as a penalty, and uh, uh, all the other prisoners were finally released. And he was the only one left in this huge prison of Spandau. And so uh, they made a little uh, uh, summer house for him out in the garden. And he would go out there and, and uh, stay and, uh, during the day. And one day, uh, uh, the, the nurses went to lunch. And they came back. And there were two strange men with him. And he had been beaten up and was barely alive and, in fact, died the next day. 
And uh, here he was, he was 90, 92 years old, or over in his 90s. And uh, uh, his son knew that I had taken care of him and, and knew him. And he said, you know, please look into this because there's something funny going on. Because the mark, they said he'd hanged himself. Well, the mark of the rope on the back of his neck, you can't see it very well here, but it goes straight across. Well, when you hang yourself, the rope thing goes down in the front and goes back over here, and you don't get it across here. And whereas if somebody garrots you by putting a rope around your neck and pulling it tight, you do get this uh, uh, line parallel with the ground, which is what he had. And uh, the other thing that happens when you hang somebody, or they hang themselves, the rope goes around the front, around the jaw, and then back up, and it does not bother their thyroid cartilage, which is that big thing that's your Adam's apple. And uh, on the other hand, if they garrote you with a rope, it breaks the little horns, the little ends off that cartilage. And this is a, a straightaway uh, good way to differentiate between hanging and garroting. And it is depended upon by forensic people uh, everywhere. Well, in his case, uh, these little horns were indeed broken off, as would happen from garroting. So everything, everything pointed to garroting, and yet the official diagnosis was uh, hanging, that he hanged himself. So the son said, well, what, can you help me with this? So I said, well, I can get in touch with the American authority on this differential diagnosis between garroting and hanging, and we'll see what he says. Well, when I got a hold of this man, he was not too anxious to get involved with this, but he said, you know, when you're 92 years old, everything is so brittle that you really can't depend on that as a as a diagnostic sign. So unfortunately, uh, I was not able to help him out, but I can tell you that my opinion from everything that I saw and heard was that he probably was garroted, and the reason was that the, the uh, Russians were finally going to relent and let him be released. All the rest of us had, had relented and written to everybody saying, please relate the old man, you know, he's doing nobody any good in prison, and so forth. Well, the Russians, had enjoyed having the changing of the guard because they had a drill team of guards who marched in a very uh, amazing way. They stamped their way along in a goose step, holding a rifle, a big, long, skinny rifle with one hand straight up, and two of them did it in concert and uh, uh, as if they were one, and it was very impressive to see. And what they would do would be to march a drill team of these people clear across Berlin uh, to the Spandau prison, and everybody would drop everything to watch this spectacle, and the, the, the uh, Russians were so proud of it, they didn't want to give it up. So they didn't want to release him, and so he stayed on and on and on, and then on the British watch, when it was the Brits' turn to guard him, uh, this uh, event happened, and there were these two strange men that nobody ever accounted for, and, and he was dead, and that was the end of it. But uh, as I say, it, it it, it certainly, and, and the reason given was, or alleged, was that the British had done some bad things to him during the four years they had him in prison, and uh, uh, he died, or they, they didn't want him to talk about it, so they killed him. Well, it's hard to know what the truth is, but these are the facts as far as we know them. And uh, 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 the next slide. Well, we, out of the trial of uh, 20, what, 22 of the men, only, uh, only, what, 11 were hanged, and uh, the army hangman moved in, and he was a very uh, laconic, uh, cynical character, but he put the traditional eight turns on the hangman's knot, and he said he great, got great pleasure out of hanging these uh, uh, criminals from Nazi Germany, and he did. And he did it very efficiently, very well. There, was, there were allegations always of, as there always are, of irregularities and failures and whatnot, and that's just not true. I mean, the, the hangings went off very quickly and very well, and if there were any, uh, any slowdowns, it was of a very minor uh, type. And uh, well, here's a sample of the rope that hanged Stryker. Uh, again, the uh, masters of the court said, now, there will be no souvenirs. Uh, and, of course, the hangman, being a cynical old guy, uh, cut off his souvenirs before he put the ropes to use. So he had them, sold them to me. And uh, well, here was another contact, uh, a Columbia graduate, uh, the psychologist that we used for the intelligence testing. And uh, the most intelligent ones of, the, of all uh, were the old uh, uh, banker and, uh, and Speer, 
and uh, they were smart as could be on these intelligence tests. Uh, they, the old gentleman uh, shocked. Uh, Jalmar Horace Greeley shocked. His parents knew about Horace Greeley. Well, I guess his mother was an American, and uh, so he was Horace Greeley shocked. He was a smart old cookie. He's cranky, but smart. And uh, he went to Franklin Roosevelt and persuaded him to forgive the German debt uh, that they were supposed to owe as a result of the, of the uh, peace. And uh, of course, Hitler turned right around and used the money to rearm. But, uh, uh, and, and he uh, turned against uh, Hitler and uh, uh, was doing all sorts of bad things. And Hitler threw him in jail. We got him, we found him in Dachau to be killed. And to my surprise, they tried him anyway. And they acquitted him, but they acquitted him on a technicality of some sort, rather than on the fact that he should never have been tried in the beginning. Well, in any case, there he was. And they acquitted this man, who was just a radio announcer. Uh, but here's the banker, uh, Funk, who didn't know where all those gold teeth came from that those Nazis kept giving him. And he also had a, a, a lot of urological problems. Uh, he enjoyed the finer things of life and had a lot of venereal disease. And uh, uh, he had a stricture, and the German doctor that I showed you before, who had been a urologist, uh, didn't have any instruments to dilate him with and uh, keep the stricture open. So I got him instruments, but this was in the days before penicillin or antibiotics, and every time he used it, this man spiked a tremendous fever to 106, <laughs> knocked him out for two or three days, but it cured his stricture. He could urinate again. And, <laughs> Uh, he entertained everybody. He could always get a champagne and, and goodies sent in uh, through his connections, uh, the guards and so forth. Never thought that was anything wrong with bringing in a few goodies. And, uh, and there he was. But uh, apropos of that, while I think of it, uh, you know, last year, people, last couple of years, people are saying, what were the most important things that happened in the 20th century? Well, in my money, for my money, the, uh, the invention or the development of antibiotics was by far the most important thing that happened. You know, before that, people died like flies of infections. Uh, you remember Calvin Coolidge had a son, got a blister on his heel, playing tennis on the, on the White House tennis courts, got infected, and the kid died. And in spite of, you know, any amount of money spent on trying to save him, didn't have antibiotics. And, uh, well, tuberculosis killed people by the thousands. Uh, in New York, we have one hospital that got 5,000 TB patients every day. And we had what, 18 big sanatoriums up around Albany uh, uh, that uh, were jammed with patients all the time. Well, with antibiotics uh, during the middle uh, of, the, of the 20th century, we discovered that we could cure it. Not with just one, we had to combine it so that you got around the uh, resistance and all that. I was in charge of the kidney tuberculosis part of that government study, and it was a tremendous uh, uh, satisfaction and accomplishment uh, to have these antibiotics to be able to do that much good. Well, as I say, this is just one small uh, example of, uh, of how it was used. Well, this, uh, this was Speer, uh, the construction man who uh, 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 Hitler realized was very, very effective and gradually put in charge of more and more things in the, in the uh, Nazi production line, uh, war production of, of, of fighter planes, for example. We bombed his factories every night, and every day he produced, his, his production rate went up. And he was a genius at this, and he was also an artist, and uh, Hitler would whip out a little a pad and, and make a little sketch of, a let's say, a memorial arch for his hometown of Linz in Austria, and he would give it to Speer, Speer would take it back to the office and have his people dress it up and, and finish it up. And he said that Hitler's little sketches were pretty good. And each one that he mounted, he would mount a letter alongside it saying, this drawing was made in my presence on such and such a date by Hitler, and, and I attest to its accuracy. And uh, I was able to accumulate a number of those. He was a very smart, kindly man. Uh, well, in, during, the, during the trial, it came out that he'd been very nice to so many people. Uh, Eva Braun, for example, well, I think we'll show something of hers, but he made a little monogram for her out of her two initials, E and B, put together like a butterfly. And he would listen to the, to the transcription by the translators, and if they made a mistake, 
uh, he'd lean forward and look at them and shake his head no, and they'd quickly change to correct what was wrong. If they still got it wrong, he'd write a little note and pass it down to them and they'd get it right. So he was very helpful and at the same time thought that they should all assume some responsibility and he could have got himself hanged and as it was, he got himself 20 years in prison. Uh, but he didn't have to, in my opinion. I thought he could have maybe deserved a year in prison or something like that, but he didn't do anything deliberately. And at the end, he was not only blocking Hitler's attempts to smash the German civilian economy to damage all their power plants and all the things that would have made life miserable for the civilians in Germany, and uh, uh, in, 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 at the end tried to kill Hitler and failed because he couldn't get the poison. But uh, we gave him 20 years in prison that I thought was a mistake. Uh, I know other people may have thought otherwise, but that was my opinion after listening to him and looking at his, all the evidence I could find. And, uh, uh, well, Hitler, you know, had these tremendous rallies. This was a field near, uh, on the outskirts of Nuremberg, and it was tremendous. It would accommodate 20 football fields on this area, and along this side there was a long, beautiful Italian marble grandstand and uh, it was a quarter mile long and in the middle right here under where this uh, tag is there was a marble swastika and uh, uh, this was so big that when I first saw pictures of Hitler and his this uh, rally that he conducted there uh, I thought it was just an empty stadium and then you saw somebody move and you realized it was solid steel helmets and it was huge and he did this every year for several years then he suddenly stopped doing it. And I wondered what in the world had happened, you know? Well, incidentally, uh, in regard to this uh, stadium, when we got there, the first thing we, the Patton did was dynamite off the swastika and uh, mount the Third Army insignia for, for uh, Patton here. And we all got up in Hitler's spot and mocked him by giving the Nazi salute and uh, over Patton's insignia. And uh, well, here was Speer. And here is the, I spoke about this little thing that he made for Eva Braun. And uh, he did that kind of thing for, for anybody, uh, uh, just naturally. And here was Eva's Paris evening bag. And inside was that little uh, uh, insignia that he'd made for her. Well, and he'd made these sketches, as I said before. And Spear would look on. And then he'd give it to Spear, who would take it back and have it improved upon or finalized. And it would start out with Hitler's little drawing like that and little embellishment here, and then this letter describing it and saying that this was made in my presence by Hitler on such and such a date and so forth. And I have I, a dozen or so of those. Uh, and a lot of, his, of Hitler's paintings, which are not bad, they're not good, they're not great, but they're not bad. And this was Speer's own little house uh, near uh, the big Burghof uh, in, in Berchtesgaden. Uh, we made it in an officer's club. Well. One of the things that Speer dwelled on uh, and that had struck me was that, that, that Hitler was preoccupied with thoughts of a, of a premature death. And uh, I didn't think that was too surprising because we were all out to kill him. And uh, <laughs> his own people, uh, you know, after the bomb plot that obviously tried to kill him. Uh, so it didn't surprise me that too much he had thoughts like that. But Speer was very impressed that, uh, that there was something funny about all this, and was something, something else going on. Well, here he is leaning forward, shuffling along in this peculiar gait that is typical of Parkinson's disease. And one of the, uh, one of the, uh, the guard officer that I spoke about before that was in charge of the Berchtesgaden compound ran into Hitler in the dark one evening when neither of them expected there was anybody there, and he looked at, at Hitler and realized he was talking to a dying man. And two or three of the other top Nazis uh, uh, discovered that as well. And uh, uh, then, looking back on it, you realize that Hitler was holding his left hand in everything. Any time that he was being photographed, here he is when Paris surrendered, you know, and here he is doing his little jig, but he's gripping something, a roll of paper, in his left hand. Because when he did that, it, it suppressed the tremor. And here is a whole series of, of pictures uh, where he's doing the same thing. He's uh, either holding that left hand uh, with his other hand or gripping something. And uh, uh, so this had been going on for many, many years and getting worse and worse and worse. And 
at the end, the thing that, that uh, tipped it all off was a newsreel by a Scandinavian newsreel company uh, that took some newsreels of him in the garden of the, of the chancellery when the, they, in between attacks, and he was congratulating some child soldiers, and uh, uh, they weren't censored, and the, the tremor, tremor, which is so typical of Parkinson's, where it's a pill-rolling tremor, the fingers go in a typical manner, uh, was obvious and uh, very clear that he had advanced Parkinson's by the time we did dawned on us. Well, uh, another side issue uh, was the fact that uh, he claimed he was uh, well-loved, he didn't have to carry a pistol. Well, he didn't carry a pistol where he could see it, but he had the lining of each one of his pockets lined with, relined with leather so he could carry a little pistol in his pocket. Uh, if any of you have carried a pistol in your pocket, you know that serrated front sight saws a hole right through your pocket very quickly. And again, this pair of trousers in our collection, and uh, it's got the, uh, the uh, last uh, pocket was being lined with leather, and this is why it didn't get burned up with all his clothing, which he ordered done. And uh, his chauffeur had to keep spare clothing for him in his car and a suitcase that fitted into a aperture in those big Mercedes touring cars uh, because with Parkinson's disease you sweat like mad, even worse than he would do just from his vigorous speaking. And uh, so he always had to have spare uniforms and uh, uh, this was one of them. That's the reason it didn't get burned up is why I was able to get it for our collection. Uh, notice that he had buttons. He didn't believe in zippers. <laughs> and uh, the next slide. Uh, well, even his socks had been darned. You can't see it very well here, but his, he was spending billions on armament with one hand, and his help was darning his socks on the other. <laughs> and, well, he shot himself finally and, and bit the cyanide capsule at the same moment and died in this uh, 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 sofa in the chancery, and uh, the Russians found him. Well, then the question, and then he wanted his body burned, so they spent all day pouring gasoline on it and burning it, him and Eva. And uh, by the end of the day, he was not completely burned, so they buried what was left of him in the edge of a shell crater right in the entrance of the, of the chancellery. Well, then the question came up, was it really Hitler? Well, here is a x-ray of, of Hitler taken because of sinus trouble. Notice that this sinus is a little foggier than this sinus, and that's a sign that he had sinus uh, trouble plugging up this uh, the mucus, uh, trying to escape from that sinus. But when you look at the x-rays a little closer, you notice there's something funny about this left central incisor. Uh, it's this tooth right here. It's the one on the left of the midline. And notice it's a frame of gold and then a porcelain uh, plate over the front. And in the photograph of him, you rarely saw him smiling because that would show us this tooth. And that particular tooth, you can see, is a different color because of this phenomenon here. And uh, there are other, other little telltale things that are typical of him. And sure enough, the body in the Chancellery Garden did have these defects, and uh, especially the lower jaw was entirely compatible uh, with Hitler. And the, even the Russians were, were inclined to accept that uh, as the truth. And I have no reason to, to doubt it. Well, among the other prisoners uh, was the man that succeeded him, uh, the Admiral, and uh, uh, he again, I think, was, was, was convicted unjustly. Uh, but uh, I, I said to, the, to various of the judges, why is it you condemn the two uh, generals and hanged them, and then you let off the two admirals with his penalty, uh, prison time? And they gave this gentleman uh, a year in prison, uh, which he quickly served. But he did something very clever. During the trial, he saw to it that the newspaper people brought around some photographs of a German submarine uh, towing this line of, uh, of lifeboats from a, a ship they had sunk. Uh, they took a chance doing that because our planes saw them and thought these were Germans and strafed them anyway. And uh, in any case, uh, when the truth was made public, uh, it, it got a lot more sympathy for the, for the German Navy in spite of their submarine uh, attacks. And by various little innuendos and, and bits and pieces of, of business, uh, they were able to uh, make themselves look better. Well, finally, uh, the, the shoulder patch that uh, uh, we made up for the, 
for the trial uh, was this uh, uh, combination of a smashed uh, German tablet, is what this is supposed to be, and the pay of the chails of justice and uh, uh, various other devices. And uh, uh, we all wore that. Uh, justice Jackson didn't wear it because he didn't wear a uniform. But he, as I say, did many things that nobody else could do. In the Army, for example, we had powerful people like Patton and, uh, and Bradley and, and uh, uh, the commanders of, uh, of the 7th Army. Those people could not order the tremendous record keeping and detailed work of the trial uh, because they didn't have the power to order one another's uh, forces to do things, whereas Mr. Jackson did. And without him, there wouldn't have been any trial, I can tell you that. Uh, from watching what went on. And he was very insistent, he was very outspoken, he was very loudspoken when he wanted to be, and uh, uh, very good at, at pulling it all together, and he did. So that while he may have sacrificed himself, I, in my opinion, uh, by uh, taking on this uh, rather peculiar job, and especially when his advocate, uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, died at the critical moment, uh, and as a consequence, when the vacancy in the Supreme Court did come up due to the death of the Supreme Court uh, boss, uh, he wasn't there to step right into it, and that was, that was too bad. As one of my children said to me the other day, he said, Dad, you're right, it isn't always what you know, sometimes it's who you know. <laughs> and when he didn't know, didn't have Franklin Roosevelt to go to bat for him, it became an entirely different ball game. But I must say uh, that uh, uh, can we turn the lights on? Somebody got the light switch at their hand? Uh, good, thank you. Uh, it seemed to me that uh, by and large that Mr. Jackson did something that nobody else wanted to do and uh, I think that he took a terrible beating as a result and uh, uh, I had to hand it to him for accepting this responsibility and doing all this uh, tremendous work and I must say that I admire uh, uh, the good work that Greg and your group is doing and in putting this center together, I was astonished to learn all of the things that you're doing and all of the bits and pieces that, that he pulled together and are now being pulled together in his memory. And uh, uh, well, <laughs> as I say, even the building, when I drove by and saw that row of columns out there, was, that's just like the house I was born in and I loved it. Well, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>
which he learned um, as time went on and, and turned against Hitler uh, in the long run. But, uh, uh, well, in, in regard to the use of slave labor, he was, he had, there was one picture of him in a slave labor camp, but only in the administrative building. There was no indication that he was involved in the slave labor aspect of it as he was uh, uh, being alleged to be involved. So I thought that he was, he was the one that was the most uh, uh, over, over treated, you might say. Uh, the other person uh, was the young man in charge of the Hitler Youth uh, who had been brought up with an American mother and uh, uh, spoke American instead of English and uh, very recognizable and used it. I mean, he was in talking to us. I mean, he was uh, very eager to chat with you and, and, and use vernacular that uh, you understood. And uh, uh, at the same time, he didn't contribute anything uh, terribly valuable to Hitler. And trying to educate the Hitler youth was a travesty. I mean, they were being, those kids were being brought up to be soldiers. And they were, they were, you know, at the end, they were using them uh, in the line uh, as, as regular soldiers. At the time of the Battle of the Bulge, which you remember Hitler instigated on the premise that if he had a victory to, to, to use as a, as a basis, then he could sue for peace with more chance of having a, uh, a good settlement. And uh, that persuaded Speer to go along with him, that maybe that was the last gasp. And in fact, the way they started out, uh, they captured something like 70,000 American soldiers in the first day. And uh, the question came up whether uh, they had been ordered to, to kill the prisoners, uh, because as you remember at Malmedy, there was a massacre by one of the SS units. And it turned out that they were not, it was obvious they were not. Von Rundstedt, the overall commander, was brought back several times uh, out of retirement uh, to try and lead up uh, token uh, campaigns, such as the Battle of the Bulge. He said, it was none of my idea, I had nothing to do with it. And But Hitler ordered it done, and uh, uh, I took over his headquarters building in Kassel, Germany, and uh, the, the drawers were full of big, beautiful parchment certificates saying, uh, with a place for the name and said who died in the service <laughs> of the Third Reich and so forth. And uh, uh, well, he, he was pushed in there by Hitler to undertake this uh, as an excuse, but it was not his idea, he was against it. And uh, Hitler said he persuaded some of them to go along with it on the idea that if he did have a victory, he could, he could then sue for peace with more, uh, more chance of success. But uh, those were, that's the way it looked to me. Dr. Rebel? Did you, did you have any talk with anybody who was involved with human experimentation or anything like that? I'm terribly sorry that I... Doctor, uh, did you talk to anybody with regards to uh, the human experimentation? Uh, well, this was brought out in the trial, and uh, I didn't speak to anybody particularly about it, except that it was perfectly obvious that it had been done, and the experimentation about how much... Uh, uh, how much freezing you could stand in, in ice cold water. Uh, these were obviously done. And uh, they would open the body to see if the heart was really still twitching a little bit and there was any hope of reviving it. And sometimes they could, sometimes they couldn't. No, this, this, this work, I'm persuaded, was done. And it was done in a very, well, orderly manner. And uh, I thought it was non-productive because it was, you know, didn't, didn't find, any, nothing came out of it that we didn't know already. And uh, if you insult the body enough, it dies, sure enough. And uh, it, was, it was brutal to see what they did. And they did it with no compunction that was scientific in their mind. And, and uh, they thought they were contributing uh, to the knowledge for the benefit of their Third Reich. And they did, that's what they did. But it was a rough thing to have to watch and then make some judgment and, and try to find anything good about it. And uh, you could say, well, you know, it was valuable to know some of these facts, but actually it wasn't. As far as I could tell, there was nothing, nothing that came out of it that was really of any value. Dr. Lamb, I'll ask a question. Uh, we talk, you talked a little bit earlier about your days at the Ashcan in Luxembourg. One of our earlier speakers here was a Ambassador John Delavoye, 
and I believe your paths crossed with his. Yes, yes, Mr. Dolleboy's was a, a very, very interesting young fellow, and uh, he had been uh, assigned as just a general duty uh, officer to go around and, and uh, chat with the prisoners. And Goering, for some reason, decided that he was a, uh, an officer appointed by the command to see that the specifications of the, of the uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, the, the uh, uh, surrender, the, uh, you know, the Geneva Convention were indeed adhered to strictly. And uh, because Goering had heard that we did that kind of thing, uh, quite differently from the way they did things, and uh, he got it in his head that, that Dolaboy's was, that was his duty. So he called him by some other name. What was the name they gave Gillen. him? Gillen, Lieutenant Gillen. And uh, uh, when, they, when, when Dolaboy's put it all together and, and deduced that that's what was happening, uh, the administration went right along with it. And uh, all of the, of the German uh, uh, prisoners and generals uh, were very solicitous of him and tried to please him and tried to give him information and they took him uh, with them to their hometowns and all sorts of wonderful things to get more information and they went right along with it and built it up into a very skillful uh, way of, of, of studying what really went on among the Germans and uh, he went right along with it and <laughs> uh, of course later uh, as, as you know he spoke German uh, and he came from 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 Luxembourg, and uh, so he spoke it with a with even a Luxembourg accent, I guess. But uh, he was full of, of great information, and uh, then went with some of them to their own hometowns, uh, and some of the generals, German generals, and got more information that nobody was able to get before, and it was very valuable as a sort of a deception. Uh, but indeed. I, I must. I, I've, I've never heard him speak, but he and I, of course, I have to fill in for him uh, at American Legion conventions. If they, if he can't go, then call on me. So, uh, no, I think uh, what he did was very skillful and very well done, and and very productive, very valuable in, in getting information. I thought you were very lucky to have him as a speaker. I tell you, among the various celebrities that Dr. Latimer has treated over time included uh, Jean Tunney, Madame Chiang Kai-shek, Clark Gable, King Siam, Prince of Wales. But tell us about Greta Garbo. <laughs> <laughs> well, Greta Garbo, Greta was a, was a, was a real doll. <laughs> she was a very quiet, uh, as you know, uh, uh, unassuming type. And, and she would try to go out by herself and escape the notice, but uh, somebody would eventually spot her, but she'd drift along trying to look in Saks Fifth Avenue windows like anybody, and uh, uh, she'd have a veil pulled down across her face or try to uh, be unrecognized, and eventually somebody would recognize her, and then she'd have to beat it home to get out of the out of the mob that would close in on her, but a very pleasant person, and in no way, uh, well, offensive or or disagreeable about any of this, except that she had to escape the attention that it, it got her. And uh, uh, like all of us, she all, everybody has a little problem now and then, you know. So she needed some medical help and sought it in the same way. And then was a was a wonderful patient. If you brought her in, let's say you wanted to take an X-ray, uh, she would pull the, the the sheets around her, and so all you saw was a little oval part of a face. <laughs> and uh, uh, she'd get trundled through the halls and get her x-rays and back to bed. And, uh, well, all I can tell you is that she was really a, a very agreeable, wonderful person, uh, but beset with the problems of having to stay out of the attention that was forced upon her by the press, well, by the public for that matter, because everybody, the minute they recognized her, she was swarmed under. But uh, that was true of, of well, you have, you had, uh, who was, who was the young lady that you have that's the famous... Uh, Lucille Ball. <laughs> yeah. Lucille uh, was, well, a little... Lucille was a little more, uh, what should I say, worldly? <laughs> uh, but, as I say, the... the, the she also played in this theater as well. <laughs> well, great, great. I thought it seemed very nice here. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? 
Uh, and what we're going to do is there's a reception downstairs hosted by WCA Hospital. Uh, Dr. Latimer, uh, you may not know this, but he's 89 years old. Uh, he's obviously spry in many parts. One of the things he's probably not so spry is jumping up and downstairs. So uh, we're going to keep him up here for those folks who want to buy a book and maybe have Dr. Latimer autograph it or, or talk to him or make it part of the reception. Go downstairs, get your goodies, come back up. Uh, but I think that'll probably be the most efficient for uh, everybody concerned. And with that, I can't thank you enough, Dr. Landmer, for sharing your time. And everything well, has been terrific. Thank you very much. Well, let me say, I, I think you're doing a great job in memorializing uh, Mr. Jackson. I, I must say, I'm very impressed with the multifaceted approach to this and the success. I'm, I'm sure he would have been proud of it. Thank you very much. With that, Glenn. <laughs> Thank you very much.